Hello there. So today I would like to talk about the Be Strong Driver. And it's a funny term to be strong. I think we all have a sense of being told we should be strong when we're little, when we're growing up. It's be strong, don't cry, you'll be all right. Come on now, put your tears away. You know those kind of messages. Don't make a fuss. Any of those kind of messages would create, develop a be strong driver within any of us. And thinking about the British and the stiff upper lip, because I am one of those, I was raised to have a very stiff upper lip, given everything. And um, <laughs> just thinking about the whole idea of a stiff upper lip, what the fuck does that mean? I guess it means that when we start to feel tearful and emotional, maybe our lip quivers. You know, you notice it around the mouth. You notice it, I think, around the mouth, first and foremost, when somebody starts to feel emotional, our lips kind of quiver a little bit, they get a little bit wobbly, like the emotions are starting to come through, the tears might be working their way towards our eyes, and our lip gets wobbly, and I think that probably is where the stiff upper lip comes in, it's like, keep it stiff, don't let the tears out, don't get emotional, stay strong. Be strong. Don't let the side down. All those kind of um, saying slogans, whatever you want to call them, they are a, a form of manipulation to make us stay strong and don't make a fuss. Now, I was raised to have a very stiff upper lip and not make a fuss. Don't bring any attention to myself. And yeah, just thinking about how much attention I bring to myself because you know, here I am. <laughs> Definitely not got a stiff upper lip right now. I'm laughing my head off. Um, really laughing. Um, here I am in front of the camera. I'm going to put this on YouTube. I have no idea who will see it and where it will go in terms of, you know, in the world. And I most definitely am not being strong anymore. And weirdly, I am much stronger than I ever was. So this may not quite make sense, and I'll explain a little about it. So the be strong driver is something that is forced upon us. We're coerced, we're manipulated to keep the stiff upper lip, not let any emotions start to wobble forward or come through from our eyes. We have to keep the stiff upper lip. We're forced to, if we don't, we'll be disapproved of. If we do, we will be approved of. And, you know, our parent figures, the caregivers, they can look down at us and be very proud of our stiff upper lip because we've managed to be very strong during X, Y, Z, whatever. Now, the funny thing is, the more emotional and real and honest and true we are, the stronger we are. So to me it makes complete sense that if we are allowed to be our true self, if we are allowed to be emotional and have a wobbly top lip, then through time we're going to be very strong. The fact that we can be true and real and authentic and you know true to ourselves, honest to ourselves, the more 
the stronger we are. So when we're coerced into something, the truth, which is the wobbliness, the emotions, they're wanting to come out in response to whatever that thing is. The parent figure says, be strong, put a stiff, you know, put a smile on that face. Don't you dare cry, put those tears away. Not interested in any tears. You know, those kind of things that parents will say to children. And that creates a defense inside of us and it creates an, is it inauthentic? I don't know what the opposite of authentic is right now. It's left my brain. Um, incongruent. So, so we have to be incongruent. In those moments of being told, be strong, don't you dare cry. I don't wanna, I don't wanna see your tears etc etc we have to be incongruent our outsides don't match our insides our insides want to cry and feel wobbly and our outsides are having to put a very stiff upper lip expression on our face and pretend to be fine i'm fine how many times do people say oh i'm fine i'm fine you meet them in the doctors <laughs> you're in the doctors you go in to see the doctor for probably something quite important and somebody says, how are you? And you say, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. Why are we in the doctors then in that case? None of this makes any sense. And when we are taught to be strong, and I imagine you probably were taught some version of being strong, some version of it. When we're little, when we're little, our be strong driver is the thing that shows up first. As soon as the parent has planted the seed in our mind, you be strong, no tears. Don't wanna hear any bubbling from you. As soon as that's been planted inside of us, every time we come to cry or feel emotional, then that be strong comes across the message. No crying, no bubbling up, I don't see any tears. All of that will be uppermost inside of us and we will have to find a way to, I'm thinking about that, Botox our face into absolute stiffness so that we please the parent. Now, later in life, we'll still be doing this. We'll still be doing the be strong stuff. And the parent might be dead. That parent figure who taught us to be strong may be long gone. And yet we still do it. Why is that? Why is that? Well, because it was trained into us. It was something that was taught to us by an authority figure. We took it in as a blanket rule. We didn't, it's like we swallowed it whole. We didn't chew it and say, oh, there's a bit of this and there's a bit of that. It goes in whole and complete. Do not cry under any circumstances. What will people think of you? And so they're using shame as well. So that stays as a well-established route inside of us, no matter what age we are, what we're doing, or how long gone that parent figure is. And this does a lot of damage to us. Having to be strong, especially in some circumstances where tears would be very appropriate and very needed, we don't hold in a laugh, do we? Well, I mean, we might at school, for example, or at a funeral, we might hold in laughter.
but generally nine times out of ten if somebody says something funny we laugh we just let it out we don't censor that But if it comes to the crying, the not being strong, that's a different thing altogether. So shame, manipulation, they are used to keep that child in check. And your child is still inside of you. Doesn't matter what age you are, your inner child is still there trying to do her or his best to please the parent in our head, in our mind. We carry that stuff on. Even when the parent is long gone, we continue the, the rules that were planted inside of us. So we may never cry, never. We, we might cry when we're on our own, we might. And that would be a really good thing. But it would be really wonderful if we could be our true emotional self, whether that's laughing, crying, angry, whatever it is, just be ourselves in the moment. Because when we're not, we suffer. And you know, I'm thinking about a, a story from my, how old would I have been? Maybe, I don't know, 12 or something, maybe say 12 years old. So when I was a kid, I was 10, I got a job working at some stables. Now this was my dream come true. Got a job, 10 years old, went for the interview, turned up drenched because I went on my bike in the pouring rain, had to be there for 8 a.m and uh, you know it's a sort of two and a half mile trek on the bike um, up the back roads and 10 years old turned up for this interview and sitting around the table with the family who you know big house lots of money loads of horses i really wanted the job really really wanted the job so I wanted that job so I was strong in the interview so I turned up drenched pretended to be fine I was uncomfortable as hell steaming the can you imagine being inside a warm house with soaking wet clothes drenched hair stuck to my my face my head and say, I'm fine, no, 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 I'm fine, I don't want any fuss, I'm, no, no, I don't need a towel, no, no cup of tea. I'm fine. So we do all the be strong, show up, be my best 10 year old self at an interview, going to be working in some stables with about 25 beasts here. We're talking about a lot of animals, um, including cats and a dog and a donkey and a cow. It was amazing, I loved it. I loved it. I didn't get paid. Now here is the first thing that went wrong for me. There's no pay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to teach you to ride when there's some spare time. That's going to be your pay. Fine, no problem. I'm happy. I'll take it. I'll take it. I want the job. So be strong. Work from dawn till dusk every weekend. 
you know, like 8 a.m. till about 6 p.m. every day. No, every weekend day and all through the summer holidays, no pay, no pay, lots of hard work. I'll take it, that sounds like my kind of job. Yes, please, I'm happy. So I took it. Now, when I got to about 12-ish, the person who ran this place, the owner, she decided that I was going to be her new, I'm not sure what she called it, but she said, I'm going to train you how to manage the stallion. This meant nothing to me. Not a thing. Nothing. And I was like, yeah, okay, whatever you say, I'll do whatever you say. I was so accommodating, so polite. I had been raised to be so polite this did me a massive disservice. You name it, I say yes. That is how I was raised. Always be polite, always put yourself last, everybody else goes before you, and keep your stiff upper lip. So, all of this did me a huge disservice. And so, 12 years old, I am being trained now how to deal with, how to look after and manage a stallion. Now, at the time, nobody told me this was dangerous. Nobody said, to be quite honest, you could die. You could be attacked by this beast and you could die. I had no idea what it meant to be um, working with or near a stallion. Now, a stallion is a male horse that has not been castrated and therefore, <laughs> and not been socialised, very young, a very young stallion, I think he was two or three years old and he was huge and he was powerful, potent, angry, fiery and I had no idea and I wasn't told about this so no warnings. I was taught how to do it but not why we do it this way. So day one of my doing it alone I thought it's okay I can do this. I've been taught what to do, I'll do it, I trusted her, this will be fine. So the first day of me being this, you know, step up in my job, <laughs> no pay still, I went in and did all the things that she told me to do, which was to tell him to get back, get back and really yell at him so that I would take control of his space. Went in, did that, he flew at me, he attacked me. I was bitten on the fleshy part of the back of my shoulder. I leaned over to pick up his bucket and he flew at me and bit me. Now, that bite, I have never, never experienced pain like it in my entire life as that bite that day. I was in shock. I was in, I can't tell you the way I felt. I can remember it right now. So it's still alive in me. This isn't a memory really. This is alive in me. So I grabbed the bucket, got out, locked the door, locked the top door, because this, this, the stable had to be locked top and bottom because I now know he was a dangerous animal. I didn't know, nobody told me. Now, my be strong kicked in just like that. Just like that. Don't tell anyone, don't make a fuss. Now, I know that I had a huge wound on the back of my shoulder. And although it wasn't bleeding, and I knew it wasn't bleeding because I touched it, so it wasn't bleeding, but I, I had never felt pain like it in my life. Never. It was horrific. The pain was horrific. And the whole of the, the right-hand side of my head, neck, shoulder, upper back, my arm, everything was stiff with pain. Stiff. So stiff. Couldn't move.
So what did I do? Now, most kids who have been nurtured and loved in a way that it's okay to tell would have sought out help. They would have been able to go and find a grown-up, tell them what had happened, have the wound or whatever had happened looked at or listened to, you know, listen to the story of what happened, probably receive a big, big hug and love and told how brave I had been and how awful it had been and this is shocking and terrible and you shouldn't be doing this job because, you know, you're not old enough or potent enough to be doing this at this age. That's the stuff that I needed to be looked after. What did I actually do? So my be strong kicked in. Don't make a fuss. Don't tell anyone anything. Keep everyone's secrets for them. So I went round the back of the stables to an area where it was kind of all built up and sat underneath a building very quietly with my back against a pillar. There was like a pillar. So I was hidden. If anyone had looked around the corner, they wouldn't have seen me. So I was on the inside of that pillar, sitting quietly, leaning, crying against that pillar, trying to cope with the pain. And that pain was radiating up, down, out. You name it, I was in agony. Agony. And I stayed there for as long as I could until someone started shouting for me. And that was because the next job had to be done. There's more and more jobs to be done here. These are working stables. People were coming for riding lessons. It was busy. So my be strong driver kicked in. It wouldn't let me make a fuss. It wouldn't let me tell anyone. It wouldn't let me get any help. That be strong had been planted from a very early age. It was very, it was like a very well established tree. So I stayed there for as long as I could, trying to recover from the attack. And I never told a soul until I got to about 40, 40 something. Now, this is one example of how teaching others to be strong. Don't make a fuss. Don't let your tears come out. Keep your stiff upper lip. Don't make any, don't, be, don't ask for help. All of these messages are so powerful, so potent, they go deep inside of us and they might stay there forever. When you go to maybe a graveside with, you know, perhaps a funeral, and your elders are there, you might see all of their stiff upper lips at play. They won't let out any emotions. They won't make, they won't say anything. They won't make a fuss. They won't look at anybody. They will stare straight ahead at the job in hand, do the biz, get back in the car, leave. There will be no fuss, no tears, no upsets. Nobody will say a thing. And that is because of that slogan from I mean, I don't know, is this Victorian? Maybe it goes way, way back before then. Who knows? It pro actually, yes, it probably goes way back because of course we have to be strong to keep the family secure and safe within the community, i.e. belonging. It's very important for survival way back. Now, it may seem like a trivial thing to tell the story of being bitten by a horse and going and hiding for probably half an hour 
and not saying anything, never saying anything. But this is actually a really big deal. It's a very big deal. I experienced a trauma, an, an attack, and that has still stayed around inside of me, even today. As I tell you the story, I can, you know, I can still, I, I remember it so vividly and clearly. That's a, that is, that really is information for me to take on board that this hasn't been dealt with yet. It's still alive in me because it's so vivid, so real, as if it's happening today. You know, I'm, I'm hiding behind that pillar with that pain. But the whole point of this story is I was given a be strong message from a very early age and that has stayed with me forever. That driver, that be strong driver, has actually affected probably every aspect of my life, throughout my whole life. You know, to show up and not show any emotions, to not be real and true and honest and open about what's going on, and it helps keep everybody else's secrets. This keeps other people's secrets, and usually those secrets are not good. These are not good secrets to keep. So, I wonder if we could have a conversation about this kind of thing. Were you given a Be Strong Driver? How was it worded to you? What messages did you directly receive from your elders, from your, the caregivers, the parents who raised you? What messages did you receive? How did they say it to you? Was it with threat? Was it, was it very in your face and don't you dare? Don't you dare, you know, that kind of, um, that kind of coercion, manipulation. It's very powerful to have the person who is raising you, who holds a lot of power in your life when you're, when you're a young child. If we go against the parent, this could bring about, gosh, so much, rejection and shame initially. And it could be being scapegoated, it could be that you won't be welcoming the family system. Now, I would like you to think back, what were the messages you received? Who said them to you? How did they say them? How has this impacted you, therefore, for the rest of your life up until this moment today? And we don't have to continue with that message. We can do things differently. Today, if I'm upset and I want to cry, I'll fucking cry. If I'm angry, I'll be angry. I won't hold it in. And this is a survival way of being. And the more we hold stuff in, the more toxic everything becomes inside of us. Very toxic. And it's almost like a steam, you know those old fashioned steam cookers? You undo the lid a little bit, it's like All that steam gushes out really fast. Well, we need to let some of that steam out of us. And we can do that in, in different ways. We could do it safely, we could, we could do it slowly and carefully, we can let those 
pieces of steam out to reduce some of the pressure inside of us so that when it comes to a moment where we need to cry, where we need to step up and say, I'm really angry and I'm going to deal with this now. So that we're not keeping the stiff upper lip, so we're not hiding things, so we're not being incongruent, so that our outsides match our insides. We are fully congruent and being very real and authentic wherever we are, and that brings incredible health. Incredible health. This will bring you incredible health and well-being, psychologically, physically. The more toxic we are inside, because we're trying very hard to follow all the rules and do all the right things, whilst trying to keep the stiff upper lip on the, you know, on the front of our face, this creates a lot of pain, a lot of discomfort, a lot of fatigue. It creates a, the, the worst kind of dissonance within. Headaches, migraine, I'm just wondering if any of these things are the things that you experience. Unable to eat or sleep or rest, all of these things. So I invite you to tell your stories, let us hear how you were taught to keep it all inside, not make a fuss, be strong, be strong. I'll be proud of you if you're strong. If you cry, I won't love you anymore. These are the potent messages that we're given when we're little and they, they influence the whole of our life. Okay, so let's meet in the group, let's talk, thank you, share, so that when you share, everybody benefits. Thank you.